So our final keynote speaker, uh, he's Odessa Born. Uh, Vitaly Galom is a uh, managing director and global head of principal investments at the San Francisco tech, firm, uh, tech investment firm EIG. He's a published author on entrepreneurship. Please join me in welcoming Odessa's own Vitaly Galom. Thank you very much. Okay, I just need the remote. Oh, there's me. So if, uh, while somebody's finding the remote, I'll tell you real quick. So Odessa Bourne grew up in Silicon Valley, grew up in Cupertino, the home of Apple. Thank you very much. And um, have been around entrepreneurship, tech entrepreneurship my whole life. Since about the age of 13, I've been on all sides of it, sold my last company in 2015, went to the dark side with corporate venture at Hewlett Packard, and now on the investment banking side, which is really the dark side, where we finance um, growth companies as well as do M&A. And uh, last year I also published a book, Accelerated Startup, which uh, kind of a culmination of all my pain and suffering uh, that I try to pass on to now the next generation. So some of that I'll talk about today. And what I'll talk to you about today is really what it will take from a venture perspective, kind of a global perspective, without all the rainbows and unicorns, what it will really take for Ukraine to become a real tech superpower in the world. Um, if you want to follow along, I'll, I'll, I have lots of slides, lots of data. I will share it with you. I'll give you a link at the end to get the slides. But if you want to follow along and tag, go for it there. All right. So we are in the most interesting time, the most exciting time to be alive in the last 100 or 200 years. We're in the third real industrial revolution, sometimes called the fourth industrial revolution. And really the most interesting part is that it's happening much faster than the previous two, right? The first industrial revolution was about 80 years, about three generations. The second one was cut off by first world war, was about 65 years, also about three generations. This one is about one generation. It's all happening during the, the course of the millennial generation, all in about 20, 25 years, and was arguably began uh, when the first smartphone, the real smartphone, came out, the iPhone. So we're about 10, 11 years in, we're about halfway in, and the characteristics of this industrial revolution is really the convergence of digital and physical worlds. So we are going through a very exciting transformation, and it's all obviously technology-driven, but it's also creating a lot of economic pain because you, don't, you can't just switch over, you can't get truck drivers with no education in science and math to become programmers overnight. So we're already seeing a lot of these political problems. But the nice and the, the good thing is that, you know, I grew up in Silicon Valley. I went through the dot-com world when I was quite young. And I've seen it all and what it took to build startups then and now. We can easily say that it's easier to start a company anywhere in the world today with the infrastructure that we have in place than it was in Silicon Valley in 1999, right? The technology stack is mature. You can turn on Amazon Web Services and be in business in 15 minutes. And what it really takes is really kind of this global perspective, right? We have the Silicon Valley uh, mindset of aggressively growing technology and, and using technology really as a leverage point, but we need math and science education. So if we take a look uh, around the world, if you look at where the top universities are in, in math and sciences, US has the biggest number, right? Followed by China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and a few in Europe, and one or two in Canada. Now, US has a really bad immigration policy where it educates the best and brightest in the world and then sends them home. So a huge loss for US and a huge win for the rest of the world. If you take a look at the global hacker rank, US is not even in the top 20 as far as best developers and best technology in the world on the software side. This is key, this is crucial, right? So huge opportunity and it's really a global picture but what Silicon Valley has is 70 plus years of technology entrepreneurship, which is the growth model and the business side behind it, which is something that you know, East European entrepreneurs are very frustrated with most of the time, and they complain about, well, why can't we get our $10 million Series A? Well, because technology doesn't matter nearly as much as the business and market opportunity. Now, let's talk about entrepreneurs real quick. Right? These are a very special breed. Uh, there are probably some folks here from startup industry with lots of experience, but people from the finance industry and other categories, you might not understand this fully. Right? The typical career, at least in the US, is you get good grades, you get into a good college, 
you get into a great company, you get regular promotions, and then one day you retire, play golf, and die. This is a normal career path in, in the Western world. And you know, this really doesn't exist anymore. The average tenure of, of an employee in Silicon Valley is under two years. So this, this old story about getting a good job and staying at a company your whole career, that is long gone, right? Previous generations. Now, everybody thinks about startup careers as a little bit different. They, they, they think it looks like this. They see this, this announcement, like GitLab was the latest one, that these guys just out of nowhere got a $100 million investment, billion dollar uh, valuation, and it's an overnight success. Well, that overnight success is something like seven or eight years in the making, and the path looks a lot more like this. It's really, really painful. This is one of my favorite quotes from Ben Horowitz. Uh, as, as a startup CEO, I slept like a baby. I woke up every two hours and cried. And I can tell you, I've, I've experienced this. Anybody that has gone through the journey, and I've done three companies over a course of 16 years, I can tell you this is reality. And it's very difficult on people. Now, it also takes a long time, right? It, it takes usually about a year to develop an idea, about two years to see if anybody cares, get your first customer. And if you're lucky and you're good, it'll take you about five to eight years to see it through. That may mean you sell the company and do well. That may mean you get to an IPO. That may also mean that you get nothing out of it and a bunch of debt, right? So if we do a little bit of math, if you go right out of college, you might uh, start your first company and it's very likely that you'll fail after about two years. So you decide, okay, I'm gonna go work for a large company, get a little bit more experienced, which is what I recommend, or go get a master's degree or God forbid an MBA, and that means you're gonna fail the second one faster. Right, so, okay, you go on to the third one, maybe five years of your life. Congratulations, you're in your early 30s, and the next one is going to take you into your mid-30s. So the point is, you can't keep doing this forever. At some point, you have to do what your mom tells you, which is go get a job. Right, so the clock is very, very short. Now, I go around the world, and I talk to entrepreneurs, and everybody complains, and everybody thinks that they have unique problems. In reality, different languages, different accents, same problems. This is really what I try to do, is my goal is to help them improve their survival rate um, in, in this mean, mean world of startups. And to do that, I like to talk about three things. How, what, and where to work on these things, right? These are very important elements. So first of all, how. Now, the how is very important. You know, every new business is not a startup. Startups are uh, something very, very special that are essentially experiments that are enabled by newly available technology that wasn't available before, that allow you to search for a new business model to allow you to do things much faster, and much cheaper, and much better, and to actually disrupt markets, right? And this usually happens in three phases. So the first phase is where you're experimenting, you have your, your little baby company that's very flat, and you're really doing experiments as quickly as possible. You're really trying to find a business model that works, you are trying to find a product market fit, means who's your customer and what's the problem you're solving. And you're trying to build a repeatable sales model, at which point you can start building some kind of a structure, a management structure. You know what business you're in and you can start scaling. So next comes the, the, the most fun part that I think is where you rapidly scale this business. This is where you go from 20 to 150 people. You maybe get break even or even profitable and you have a real business on your hands and you really start hiring people with gray hair or no hair that are experienced and know this particular industry. So now you're a player. And then you graduate and you become a company. So when you hear companies like Uber or Airbnb that's about to go public next year call themselves startups, in reality they've been companies and private enterprises for a long time. They've already figured out, they've gotten out of the startup phase and they've become real businesses. And this is really the goal of this whole journey, is not to keep going to conferences for five years, giving your business card and taking five, 10 accelerator programs, but it's really about getting from startup, from idea, from experiment, to a big business as quickly as possible. And I can't overemphasize that enough. Now, if we get a little bit academic for a second, Clayton Christensen at Harvard Business School popularized the technology lifecycle S-curve. This is a very important concept in how venture capitalists look at different categories, look at different themes that come up, and how entrepreneurs should also think, look at this as well. So with every new technology, there's a research phase where a lot of time and money and resources and effort goes into 
creating a new technology. At some point, it becomes ready for prime time, and this is really the sweet spot where you want to invest. This is the startup sweet spot. This is a short window of two to five years where you're going to see the next enterprises or the next billion dollar companies come out, the category creators. And then at some point that window closes and you have large public companies that own that market. So would you start a new social network now? Probably not, not if you're smart, right? So the question is what's coming next? You can't look to the past, you have to look to the future. And the interesting thing about this whole process is if we change this graph a little bit, you know, startup and venture capital has a very unique financing model. It's called staged financing, where as you progress and you achieve certain things and you hit certain milestones, you increase progressively more money, or you raise progressively more money. And by the way, we'll maybe talk about this on a panel, but ICOs kind of violate this in a way which is a problem because the failure rate at every step is quite high. So generally you, get, you have a concept and you have a team that's capable, you can raise seed capital, you have early validations, first customers, you can raise Series A, you get real market traction, you raise the next round, you scale on and on and on, you raise subsequent rounds of financing until you reach predictable scale and that's where you will IPO, right? So this is the general model, it's never this clean, there are some some steps backwards, there are down rounds, there are all sorts of things, and many, many companies die along the way, right? Now, Silicon Valley has gone through this for a long, long time. So if we look at these different technology S-curves now with a little bit of context, you can see how they build on top of each other, where you have the integrated uh, circuits, the semiconductor companies that started. 20 years later, we got personal computing wave. 20 years after that, we got the internet wave. Then we got the mobile wave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a couple of them, like clean tech and nano, never really took off and became big categories, right? So sometimes we have false starts. We can probably say that VR, as much hype as there was for the last few years, is really a bit of a false start. It's seeming now that blockchain is probably more of a J-curve of anything at this point, and we're gonna wait for the second generation or third generation of those companies. Now, what to work on? Uh, this is really important to kind of look to the future and where are the possible future categories. Let me go back for a second. Important quote, so from, uh, from BCG, Boston Consulting Group, you know, this is something that will let sink in. In the next 10 years, 75% of the world's 500 biggest companies that will be around 10 years have not been started yet. All right, so think about that. So some of the biggest companies have not been started yet. There's a ton of opportunity. And this is increasing, right? Every, every 10 years, the Fortune 500 gets refreshed faster and faster. Now, I look at four particular areas um, for opportunity that I think are coming as part of this next industrial revolution, healthcare and food, finance, economics, transportation, logistics, or mobility, and manufacturing, future manufacturing. And if we take a look at kind of, as we dive into this, this comes from CB Insights. You know, there are a lot of really interesting categories that are a combination of these concepts that really will change the world. So we have neurotechnology, regenerative medicine, autonomous construction, and many other categories that really weren't possible a few years ago, right? It's only now that we have machine learning, we have AI maturing and different technologies coming, coming uh, like 3D printing, et cetera, that enable big, big changes across these categories. Um, AI, artificial intelligence, is not really just a, a, a technology per se, it's more of an era. Just like we had the mobile era that changed the way we do everything, and it went mobile, before that we had a, the, the personal computing era, etc. now we have the AI era which will change absolutely every category. So there'll be automation in manufacturing, there'll be automation in enterprise software, in consumer software, we're going to learn to live with computers being much, much smarter, right? So this is what AI is. It's not a particular category to invest in. And if we take a look at, we kind of double click, we see that AI is already transforming, for example, finance. We have companies that are automating what very expensive financial professionals used to do before. Wall Street looks nothing like it did 10 years ago, and accounting is changing, the legal profession is changing, because AI is automating a lot of that work. And investments in artificial intelligence, you know, it takes about 10 years for a company to go from seed investment to go public. So venture capital is looking approximately a decade ahead of public markets. You can see this upswing in investments in artificial intelligence 
among different categories. It is really the hottest space for the last few years. And you can see that if in 2017 we had a big peak, 2018 at the end will probably be higher. We're probably going to start seeing huge companies that are artificially intelligence dependent going public in about eight or 10 years. That's what we have look, to look forward to. And this is enabling kind of second order and third order uh, changes. So we're seeing the entire mobility, the entire car industry changing, right? We have two factors. We have el electrification, which changes all the powertrains, and we have autonomous, which will change the concept of a car or a truck, right? You won't need to own it. And things like insurance are a second factor. You know, the insurance industry will change behind it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So huge transformations in, in large categories. Now, you can tell that it's a big deal because the, some of the slowest moving companies in the world are automotive manufacturers, and they really started investing and partnering and acquiring startups aggressively a couple of years ago. So you can tell that large industries are already taking this very seriously. Uh, the other area is healthcare. Healthcare in the US is 19% of the entire economy. This is many, you know, this is about, what, 20 times bigger than Ukraine's entire economy is the US healthcare industry. And you can see automation and uh, digitalization of the entire uh, stack in medicine from back office to administrative to actually surgery and medicine, et cetera. And a lot of it is happening in, outside of US because US has the, the most stringent FDA regulations. So a lot of the innovation, a lot of the experimentation, R&D happens outside and then comes into the biggest market, which is the US. So again, this is a big advantage for companies working outside of US. Now, another area that I've been starting to pay more attention to recently is uh, livestock production, right? And how environmentally unfriendly all those hamburgers are that we love to eat. And, you know, if, um, if cattle nation, if, if cattle was a country or cattle production was a country, it would be the third in the world after U.S. and China in um, greenhouse gas emissions, right? So this is really not just affecting resources, but really affecting our environment and needs to be fixed. And our, our population is only growing. The appetite for meat is only growing. So what's happening there is, is something really interesting where we have uh, meat production going to lab grown. There's already some early companies working on this, and we're going to see this completely transform in the next five years, where before we had you know, barn breeding, feeding, slaughtering, processing meat. Now it's only going to be grown in a, uh, in a laboratory, and then it will still be meat. It will taste and look and perform like meat, but the, the beginnings of it are quite different. And what does that mean for us? So for an average uh, pound of beef, right, we right now have to spend 1,800 gallons of water, right, 260 square feet of land, which is what, about 25 square meters, and it costs us about a, a little over a dollar per pound to, to generate meat. Now, with lab-grown, it's a lot less water, it's a lot less land, a lot less greenhouse pollution, and right now, the only thing that's stopping it is the cost. The cost is still expensive, but it will go down. It will go down very, very fast. So as soon as we approach the same production cost, you'll see the switch happen really fast. Now, the question is, you know, the mobile era, we can say, is over. There are two and a half million apps in the App Store. You launching an app doesn't mean you're going to get success. That means you're going to spend a lot of advertising dollars and try to be a little bit profitable. It's very, very difficult to be the next Instagram. All of that is pretty much done. The question is, what are we going, where are we going next? And where should you be looking next as an entrepreneur, if you're an entrepreneur? And if we look a little bit uh, deeper in some of the technology, so we have hypermobility, IoT, Internet of All Things, smart machines, and 3D transformation. These are kind of particular hotspots that are quite interesting. If we look at hypermobility, you know, before, we now take for granted that we have high-speed Internet in our pocket. We have, uh, we have smart watches on our, on our wrists. And 10 years before that, that would have been magical. That would have been amazing to think that we're going to have that in 10 years. So what can we look forward to in another 10 years? Well, we're talking about things like nanobots. We're talking about nanobots swimming in your bloodstream, right? So you're becoming really an android, right? And it may sound a little bit scary now, but there are companies working on this, and in 10 years, this will be reality. If we look at IoT, it's really like the letter E, like e-commerce was added in the dot-com days 20 years ago, 
where it was kind of glued on to everything. And just like IoT is now being glued on to everything as well. And in reality, what people can consider IoT are very cheap Bluetooth-enabled devices that they buy on Kickstarter that don't work like they intended to. But in reality, internet of all things means that everything will be internet connected, collecting and analyzing data and making some difference in your life, some substantial difference. So perhaps in the future, we'll have you know, chairs with sensors, occupation sensors, which will adjust the air conditioning in this room. It's a little warm and things like that, where we won't even notice, it'll be transparent. So that's really IoT. Now, smart machines, you know, robots 1.0 is hydraulic muscles, where we're automating physical tasks, a lot of times just repetitive physical tasks, and, and that certainly changed manufacturing. With smart machines or robots 2.0, we're talking about uh, hydraulic brains, machines that can make decisions, All right? So this will change manufacturing, among other things, quite a lot. And if we take a look at uh, a couple of examples, so this is Breakout, a classic video game. Um, the, uh, there was a group of uh, researchers that wanted to teach a machine learning algorithm how to play this game. And all they did is said, okay, here are the rules, here's how you play the game, learn by yourself. So at first, the, the software really wasn't playing very well, it kept missing, but after a while it understood what the, what the goal was, was starting to get some feedback, and really started to get good. So after a few games, it started playing like a very capable human player. After something like 40 rounds, then it, it figured out how to beat the game in one move, in one hit. Something way beyond what humans can do, right? So, okay, this is all fun and games. What does it really mean for us? What's the practical application? So you can start applying the same thing, same machine learning um, approach to science that we couldn't, that we, science puzzles that we can't solve. So a flatworm, uh, how it regenerates when you cut it in half, is a puzzle, biological puzzle, that scientists have been trying to solve for over 100 years and have not been able to. Well, a machine learning algorithm was able to solve that biological model in 42 hours. So we're now able to do things with machine learning that humans can't do, period, in no reasonable amount of time. And that really gives us a huge advantage. So that's where we're going with it. And then if you look at uh, what are specific applications, I give you Pepper, which in 2015 was a kind of humanoid, ro humanoid robot that was introduced in Japan. They sold out a thousand units in, um, in under a minute. And it's really the first robot designed for, hum for a human interface where it can read and show emotions. When we're talking about industrial robots, you know, there's obviously no emotion involved. We're just trying to be very efficient with how things are done. But when we're talking about something that needs to interact with humans, and in Japan where we have a very old population, where this will be a real human companion, we have to build in that soft logic, that very difficult ability to read emotions and show emotions. So this is really where it's all going. Now with 3D transformation, I spent a couple of years at Hewlett Packard, 3D printing was a major topic. And I'll tell you, it, it's, it's quite interesting uh, how, you know, I think people, most people underappreciate how big of a deal 3D printing is. You know, Pre-industrial revolution, everything was handmade and time sensitive. That industrial revolution gave us blueprint design and mass production. That was a huge change in the way things worked, in efficiency, in people's lifestyles. And then the internet gave us computer-aided design and just-in-time production. So we're now approximately here today, right? About 20 years later, after internet really came online, and what we're now getting into is being able to have a completely digital workflow. That means you design and you manufacture by pressing a button at the end, completely digital. And that's 3D printing. And then in the future, we're, all, we're talking about completely democ uh, democratizing manufacturing. That means that you will have a 3D printer in your home, you will order something on Amazon or Rosetka, and then you push a button and it gets printed at your house. Right? So it might sound crazy now, but in 10 or 20 years, you'll remember this speech and that's where we'll be. So it's incredibly exciting and it's, and it's really being powered by this concept of a voxel, this volumetric pixel. And with, you know, we can go voxel by voxel and program the properties of each one of those grains of sand, right? It could be the color, the transparency, the electric conductivity, all the properties of, of each pixel. And this is how we can build complete products, including power supplies, including 3D printed batteries, everything. And that will ultimately give us complete products that we can print 
we'll even be able to print food, right? So you, like if you're a fan of Back to the Future 2, if you remember, they just punch something that looks like a microwave and it printed out a complete pizza, we'll get there. Or something like where you, you'll be wearing an Apple Watch 25, which will do a blood test, will tell you what kind of vitamins you're missing, and you can print out vitamin D and take a pill. All right, so things like this will be coming online. Now, of course, how can we talk at a conference without talking about blockchain, right, especially in Ukraine? So blockchain is quite interesting. You know, the basics everybody here knows, centralized, decentralized, and distributed data models. And here's a traditional model. We have client, server, and a database, and we have one database that's a master that's owned by somebody. The new model is that we have multiple copies, so therefore you can create digital trust. All right, so that's really what it's all about. And certainly there are very specific, very obvious use cases for this identity. Uh, notary meaning to be able to confirm a transaction that happened. We can, uh, we can also have digital assets or digital securities, so kind of a, a newer version, a smarter version of stock certificates and, and partial ownership. And smart contracts are part of that. We can have digital voting, not in America because we barely can have normal voting. Uh, but in other countries, smaller countries like Estonia, for example, this is reality. Maybe in Ukraine much sooner than in US. And we can have things like distributed storage, which are quite interesting, though the use case is not that big of a deal yet because I happen to trust Dropbox or Google or Microsoft, etc. Now, other than that, you're going to hear about a bunch of bullshit that really has to die. And this is the first generation of blockchain where you have uh, companies or you know, concepts, ideas, where people are presenting things that are really not realistic, not practical. Nobody will be able to change an industry overnight. You need a lot of players. Nobody can do it alone, right? So we're really in the world of where, you know, if you're a technologist, we're kind of at the level of TCP IP in the internet days, and we have a lot of work to do to build a blockchain-based world. So it's still going to take a lot of time, maybe five or 10 years at the very least. And despite that, let me go back real quick. Oh. So despite that, we already have an interesting ecosystem and a, and a stack building out in the blockchain world. Most of these companies, probably half of them already don't exist. Most of them won't exist. A few will survive, kind of like dot-com days. And we will have a second and third generation resurgence in a few years where we're going to start seeing really valuable, interesting things come online. Now where? This is really important for Ukraine, right? We're obviously not in San Francisco. We're in my hometown, Odessa, as much as I love it. Um, if you look at, let me go back. Uh, if we look at the global startup ranking, these are the top 20 ecosystems for startups in the world. Ukraine is not even on the map, right? Nowhere close, right? We have major hubs in Asia. We have major hubs in Europe. We have Silicon Valley in New York as number one, number two, for obvious reasons. So. You know, Ukraine likes to talk about, you know, some of the, you know, we obviously want to highlight fourth most educated country, decent size uh, population, lots of IT, software engineering, number one in Central and Eastern Europe, a lot of these really good things. And in agriculture as well, like potential to be a world leader, world top five, right? And, and you know, we, we have growing investments, but there's big argument now, what do you count as a Ukrainian startup versus not? What do you count, you know, is it, does the company have to be in Ukraine when it receives the investment? Does it have to have one Ukrainian founder? Could it have uh, one grandparent that's Ukrainian? Because that would be half of US. Um, so that's the question, right? And it's not even on the map. So the question is, how do we, how do we get Ukraine on the map? Right? And, and here are really, here are the top areas. You know, we have Europe, Middle East, we have Asia Pacific, we have all these areas. These are the top 50 or so where things are happening. And they're all centered around universities or government projects, et cetera. So how do we get Ukraine there? Well, it's very important to understand what an innovation cluster is and how these ecosystems actually come together to begin with. Now, we first start with entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs, uh, in this case, need to be technologists, right? And we need venture capitalists to give them money. This is the very basics. Now, but that's not enough on its own because Major companies are strategic investors, about a third or more of all venture capital, either directly or through investing into venture funds, comes from major corporations, and that's growing. 
They are investing directly, they're conducting R&D and investing billions of dollars into new technology, and they are ultimately potential acquirers. Many more companies get bought than go public. And the reason that companies are much more valuable in Silicon Valley than they are anywhere else, even in other parts of US, is because all of the acquirers are right there. And the odds of getting acquired if you fail to meet your goal of being the next Yahoo, Google, etc., you might get acquired. If you're a Ukrainian company, you might have some good tech, but it's much, much more difficult. Now, universities are a very important part of this, that graduate engineers, Ukraine has this, right? And you, you need management. So this little bubble right here, this management bubble, is Silicon Valley's secret. It's not just the money. It's the many, many generations of experience management. So in Silicon Valley, at any given point, you have about 50,000 director level managers that have taken a company or been part of a company that went from idea to exit. Nowhere in the world do you have even close to that. So when companies are growing very quickly, they're going from 20 to 150 to 2,000 people, they need management to be able to fill in the blanks and be able to scale the company and make fewer mistakes. This is why companies come to Silicon Valley, not the money itself. And you need professionals, you need lawyers, and you need accountants that understand startups. Right, they understand how to help you with the round. They, they can advise you on how to structure things so you don't blow up your company. This is also very important. Now, in Ukraine, the government factor is quite absent. And this is really the biggest problem. Because government's job is to create the economic conditions for all of this to work. Right? Without government involvement, and I'll give you examples in a second, this just doesn't work. As much as we'll try really, really hard, and there are lots of people donating their time and spending, investing their own money and knowing that they're going to lose it, it's just not going to work, right? Now, all of this is, lives in large pools of private capital, and ultimately, you need some kind of a public market to turn that money into stock back into, hopefully, more money, right? So, the economic impact of venture capital is crucial. In the US, about over 40% of the companies that are public at one point started with venture capital. But they are one and a half times larger almost on average, right? They're, they're almost about 60% of the market cap for the entire public market. And they're more efficient, fewer employees. And the biggest stat is that they, they are responsible for over 80% of the R&D money that's invested. So this is key, right, to the overall econ economic health of a country. So how do others do it? Well, if we look at a few examples, here's the UK. 66.7 million population, GDP of $2.6 trillion. And since 1994, 94, 95, 2012, has started pulling levers on tax, tax programs that are creating incentives for people to invest private capital into startups, right? It's advantageous for them to do that, right? None of this exists in Ukraine. The impact is that, um, over 16 billion pounds has been raised since 94, supporting over 22,000 companies in the UK that were created. 20,000 plus individual investors invest through these programs every year. 20,000 angel investors. How many angel investors are there in Ukraine? Like five? <laughs> Maybe 20. And over 3,000 companies received uh, 235 million pounds through S SEIS uh, alone. This is the main tax program that allows you to write off 150,000 pounds when you invest into a startup, right? If you, go into, if you go into the tube in London, you're actually going to see big ads for crowdfunding. It's amazing, you'll never even see this in the US, right? And then government ventures, actual direct investment by the government into companies. There have been several programs as well, ECF, UKIIF, ACF, etc. Right, so the government it knows that technology sector brings jobs, creates jobs, drives the economy, and is investing directly into these companies, into venture capital, etc. Okay, let's look at Israel, a country much, much smaller than Israel, uh, than uh, Ukraine, and um, about a quarter of it speaks Russian, and about half of the tech scene speaks Russian because a lot of people saw opportunity and went there. You know, GDP is $374 billion, and the main program that ran from 1993 to 97 is Yozma, which invested directly into companies as well as into VC funds, so a fund-of-funds concept. 
Now, they invested only $80 million for a 40% stake in 10 new VC funds, and that was really the beginning of it all. Right? They insured the downside risk by 80%, so this encouraged outside capital, foreign capital, to come into the country as well. Then other programs, the Manoff funds in 2009, after the crisis, instead of retracting, go government of Israel doubled down and invested in its, in its entrepreneurs. The minority fund uh, that, that's helping minority-owned businesses in Israel, and many, many different programs, right? right? The impact is that Israel venture capital grew from $58 million in 1991 to $3.3 billion in nine years, right? To $5.4 billion in um, uh, five point five and a quarter billion in 2017. Last year we have record for. Now the Yozma 20 million dollar fund. This is pretty amazing. Invested in 15 companies, nine of which IPO'd or got sold. Any venture fund in the world would be very envious to have that kind of track record, right? So a lot of different successes. And today we have 70 plus venture firms in Israel. We have 350 plus international R&D centers with a relatively small population. And this is really the startup, startup nation. Uh, this is how it all came together. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't luck. It was a lot of work over time. And then the last example I'll give you is Singapore, probably the most recent example. Singapore is even smaller, 5.8 million population, 324 billion GDP. Billion dollars was committed in 1991 to create different fund structures to encourage technology innovation in Singapore and create a hub out of it. Right? So, all of these things have driven, you know, and Singapore is quite the hub in Southeast Asia. It attracts many, many startups from all the surrounding countries that are much bigger. There's a billion people in Southeast Asia, only 5.8 million in Singapore, and it is the hub. It is the center. So is it possible for Ukraine? I think so, right? So, you know, we, we have in Ukraine 44 million official population, GDP of 119 billion, depends on how you count, and all these things that... You see in all these wonderful reports on PR about number one, number two in different agro categories and so many smart people being graduated from college every year, yet zero government support equals zero results and the best and brightest are forced to leave the country. This is the reality of it, right, as soon as possible. So if we take a look at where the world is going in the next decade, you know, different parts of the world are going to develop at different rates, and there will be different, uh, different focus areas. And you can see, you know, Asia, China, greater China is going to continue outgrowing everybody just because of the size of population, and really a lot of government involvement in this process, right? We're expecting 5% GDP growth uh, to 2030, and you look at Africa, which is not talked about nearly enough, where there's really no infrastructure in a lot of areas, and it has an opportunity to leapfrog a lot of countries. Just like Southeast Asia did in the previous generation, there was really little there, but now you go to Southeast Asia, super modern mega cities with infrastructure that most cities in the U.S. could be jealous of, right? So this is the opportunity. We have a lot of things happening out there. Ukraine has a lot of raw material, very little support, and a lot of potential, right? So this used to be inspirational. Now it's a little bit ironic, right? This is a quote from Hillary Clinton, fail to plan, plan to fail. So I hope uh, those, of, those folks that, are, that have the ability and power to be influential in government policy in Ukraine are able to think about these things and move forward and support technology entrepreneurship and agrotech because this is what this country can be one of the best in the world at. So with that, I will ask my panelists to come join me on stage. We're going to talk about this. These are investors that are actually investing in Ukrainian companies, and hopefully we'll get some uh, really interesting answers. Um, if you want the slides, go to golem.net slash Ukraine, and you'll get a link to the slides. So panelists, please join me on stage, and we'll dive in. Thank you. Thank you.